Now, it's my great pleasure to move to our next session uh, and to welcome uh, the chair of the next session on the impact of uh, climate change on health, Professor Fran Baum. Welcome, Fran. Uh, Professor you. Baum is an international leader in, in public health social science. Uh, she's a Matthew Flinders Distinguished Professor of Public Health and Foundation Director of the Southgate Institute for Health, Society and Equity at Flinders University in Adelaide, Australia. She's made major contributions to the understanding of the social determinants of health, health promotion and the use of qualitative methods. Work is widely cited, 6,000 citations in the H-Index of 38, Fellow of the, Academy, of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia and a life member of the Public Health Association. And critically, she's acting co-chair of the Academy's Climate Change and Health Steering Committee. And it's my great pleasure uh, to invite her to introduce our keynote address speaker, Dr. Nick Watts. Thank you very much, Fran. Yeah, lovely. Thank you very much, Graham. And I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to everyone from the lands of the Ghana people and to pay respects to the elders past, present and future. And also, particularly in relation to this session, their custodianship of the beautiful Ghana lands. Um, and it's very exciting. Um, as Graham said, I'm at the moment acting co-chair of our climate change and health group in the academy. So I think it's particularly exciting for us to um, have uh, Dr. Nick Watts speaking with us. Um, Nick is a, has been a public servant, an advocate, public health doctor, and at the moment he's got the wonderful title of Chief, Chief Sustainability Officer for NHS England and NHS Improvement. And I think, Nick, you've worked in medicine in many settings in Australia. You've got a great understanding of the UK and Australian health systems. Um, you uh, you also were the lead author on the Lancet Countdown paper on, on climate and health, which is such an important piece of work that sort of ends by saying it's trying to uh, provide a clear imperative for accelerated action that puts the health of people and the planet above all else. And um, you have worked with the WHO, Royal Medical Colleges and the UK NHS Sustainable Development Unit. So I can't really think of a, a better person um, to speak to us about how your work with the NHS is going and hopefully some lessons for us in Australia. So over to you, Nick, and, and welcome. I know it's 4.30 a.m. for you, so I'm particularly <laughs> grateful for you getting up at this ungodly hour. Of course, of course. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fran. Thank you, Graham. Thank you, everyone, for... Um, inviting me it is 4 30 in the morning but god you wouldn't believe how nice it is to be at a conference to be at an event where i don't have to apologize for my accent or where someone doesn't say oh nick the scottish the english they don't quite understand you do you mind if we translate some of what you're saying with subtitles it's so nice um, i'm from perth Western Australia. Um, uh, I now work uh, up in London with the, with the National Health Service here. Um, so I'm an Australian talking about the British, and I'm going to say some nice things about them, which I, I presume means you can, you can sort of take that with maybe a slighter degree of confidence than you might if the English were saying nice things about them. I work for the NHS. The NHS has cared about climate change. It has cared about sustainability and sustainable development for a long time. 2008, the Climate Change Act for the United Kingdom came into force. The NHS responded because it understood it had a need to respond to that, both uh, in terms of just good common sense public health, but yes, also legally there was a requirement and there are reporting requirements underneath the Climate Change Act that we have to respond to. And that went on for about 12 years or so. Last year, 2020, I think things have stepped up, not just a gear shift or two, but an order of magnitude in terms of how the NHS is thinking about climate change, how we are building it into the core of everything we do, um, how much resource we're throwing into it. And so I was going to talk about three things. Why? why the NHS would care, what we're doing, and kind of the more interesting part, right? Because climate change sustainability is this fantastic place where we can all talk about talking 
and talk about all of the fantastic connections between X and Y and different tenets of sustainability and never actually manage to do anything tangible. So I was going to talk about the how as well. Um, and the how maybe is where we can talk about, okay, yes, yes, yes. But what does this mean for a doctor, for a nurse, for a pharmacist, for a healthcare system, not in 2045, but tomorrow morning? What does this mean for an individual tomorrow morning when we're going to wake up and we're going to have to actually go and do something about this? So we'll start with the why. The why is very, very simple, right? Um, the climate crisis is a health crisis. That's a simple, simple statement, easy to sort of roll off the tongue, but maybe to explain what the NHS, what health professionals around Australia and around the world mean by that. Climate change is simple. You're adding energy into a closed system. The atmosphere is a closed system. You're throwing huge amounts of energy into that system. You throw energy into a fixed system, you'll end up with more volatility, right? You'll end, end up heating things up, things will get excited. That excitement results in, for the United Kingdom, the three things we are worried about, flood, heat wave, and the spread of infectious disease. How much energy are we talking about adding to the system? Very roughly, it's about six atomic bombs worth of energy being added up into the atmosphere, that much additional energy added into the atmosphere every single second of every single day of every single week, month, year, for decades, huge amounts of energy, planetary scales of energy. And so for that reason, the impacts you would expect to see are pretty enormous. For the United Kingdom, we expect a six-fold increase in the frequency, in the intensity of floods. And flooding is a big problem in the UK. For the NHS, 2035, pretty soon actually, we expect a doubling in the number of NHS facilities, this is anything from where we store uh, blood and transport goods through to, uh, through to our clinics, our hospitals, our ambulance stations, a doubling in the number of NHS facilities on high risk flood zones. We also expect a doubling around a little bit of a shorter timeline in the average duration of heat waves. Heat in the United Kingdom is not quite uh, heat in Australia, but we're not ready for it. Right, The buildings are not ready for it, the health professionals are not ready for it, the patients are not ready for it. And so heat in the United Kingdom is actually very often quite fatal. Um, double that average duration, move from two and a half uh, days to three, four, five. That's where heat waves turn from something that's fun and we can talk about you know, politely in the newspaper to something that actually is very, very dangerous. Um, Public Health England detected for the very first time endemic species of Aedes aegypti down in the very south of England. First time, I should say, in about 60 years. It's been here before. Um, the climate crisis is a health crisis, and to the extent that the NHS knows that we exist, we were founded to deliver high-quality care for all now and for future generations, you just cannot do that. Not possible unless you respond to climate change. That's the first reason. It's very simple. The second reason is, I told you we've been doing this for a little while, we've managed to reduce our emissions by 30% in the last decade, in the last 10 years since we've been trying. That 30%, it has saved us not a little bit of money, it has saved us hundreds of millions of pounds as we've done that. And what is really critical is when we go out and we ask our patients, hey, listen, we did a whole bunch of things. You may not have noticed, but we did a whole bunch of things to respond to climate change. What did you think about them? They shout back at us. We loved it. That was so great. Hospitals across the country. And when we ask our staff, the NHS is the world's fifth largest workforce, 1.4 million healthcare professionals. When we ask 1.4 million healthcare professionals, what do you want to see the NHS do more of? We have an annual survey that goes out every year. Nine out of 10 NHS staff shout back Listen, I want to see the NHS tackle climate change. It's not in my DNA to work for an organization that doesn't. You told me, everyone told me, first do no harm. Premium non notere. I want to work for an organization that shares my values. I was really worried that in 2021, when we asked that question again, people could be forgiven, right? There's a lot going on in the world. 
asking everyone again, listen, seriously, do you really want us to tackle climate change or would you rather we dealt, dealt with a few other things as well? The percentage points increased. A couple more health professionals, 93%, wanted to see the NHS respond to climate change. It was more urgent, not less, in 2021. That's the why. You can't do the core business of the NHS unless you respond to climate change. It turns out that response is damn good for public health. It's just common sense medicine. And it turns out that our staff and our patients, they love it. So the what? About two and a half years ago, um, the NHS said, okay, well, listen, we need to take this quite seriously. It's very important that we have an ambitious goal, but it's very important that that goal is actionable, practical, feasible, that we have the resource to actually deliver against it. So it was January 22, I want to say, 2020, we convened a net zero expert task force. Very clever people scattered across the country. Um, all very excited to do their work. Uh, the one problem was that on the 25th of January, 2020, the WHO declared a public health emergency of international concern. So we continued our work quietly, slowly working through what on earth does it actually mean? It took us nine months. What does it mean to be a net zero healthcare system? Never been done before. So you're going to have to make it up as you go. It's going to be quite complex. There's going to be a lot of things you know. There's going to be a lot of things that you don't know as well. So we had to work through that. We got to October, about 12 months ago. I took the plan, the strategy to the public board. We were asking for approval, but I also said to them, listen, I would understand. This is twice now. I said, I would understand if you told me, Nick, the NHS has a lot going on. We don't have time to do both COVID response and the response to the climate crisis unanimously unanimously every single member of the nhs board said what are you talking about the climate crisis is a health crisis we absolutely have the capacity we are the health system of the united kingdom we have the capacity to respond to both of these crises in fact it would be wrong for us not to and so the nhs adopted two new targets for the emissions we control directly, but we have levers we can identify, a net zero strategy of 2040 is what we're aiming for, aware that that's a long way in the future, an 80% reduction target by 2028. And that's perfect because that makes me uncomfortable because it's soon. And that's exactly what it's designed to do, make people uncomfortable, make sure that we understand that this is real, tangible, that we should and will be held to account for it. But we're good healthcare professionals, right? And we understand that healthcare doesn't just start and end within the four walls of a clinic, it goes well beyond that. And so for the emissions that we don't just control directly, but we know that we have a responsibility to our global carbon footprint, we have a net zero strategy for 2045. Five extra years, but it's been, gonna mean that we're gonna have to get the rest of the world on side with us, because this is our broader supply chain, it's all of the interactions we have with other healthcare systems all around the world. So that's the why. You can't, you can't do the core business of the NHS unless you respond to climate change. The what? Net zero. Big, big planetary scale challenge requires something pretty damn absolute to respond to it. I'll finish with the how, because this is, I think, probably the most interesting part of this discussion, and maybe we can focus a couple of questions if there's time. Um, there, we've had 12 months. Right, 12 months ago, the NHS made this net zero commitment. In fact, uh, I started my full-time employment with the NHS uh, 12 months ago yesterday. Um, no, it's an exciting, 26 October, 2020. Um, first time they'd ever had a chief sustainability officer. Um, bit of a shock to the system for them, I'm sure. A lot has happened. We've gone from a team of four and a half staff to 170. We've set up new net zero ambulance teams, new net zero medicines teams, net zero nursing, medical, every single region of the NHS, um, uh, all with their own teams dedicated to looking at carbon, dedicated to figuring out internalizing what does this mean for you locally. We have worked with every single hospital. We now have 155 net zero strategies in the NHS. Every hospital, every trust is working to internalize and localize and personalize what this national strategy means for them. 
We even have hospitals and trusts that have said, and this is now hundreds of thousands of healthcare professionals that have said, we're going to build this net zero requirement into the core job description of every single nurse, pharmacist, physio, doctor, chef, supply chain manager in our hospital. It's in everyone's new job descriptions. It's in the NHS constitution now, and it's about to be, give it a second, um, in the new health and care bill built into the legislation, into the core DNA of the NHS. We've also made sure along with those 155 net zero strategies that there's a board level, right? This is serious and it needs serious risk oversight and management. There's a board level lead to uh, review, report on, and really drive forward the work that has to happen at a trust, so at a hospital level for the NHS, um, the whole way up. So it took us 12 months, but we are cautiously optimistic. We're proud, I think, to be able to say that the NHS has reduced its emissions in those 12 months by 1,260 kilotons of carbon, real carbon. The equivalent, we're big, so it makes sense, but the equivalent of 1.7 million flights from London to New York, 1.1 million homes in the United Kingdom powered every year. Everyone's really excited by that number. And I think we should be proud of it. It's a, it's a real achievement. It also, we have to be careful. It's going to get harder, right? Um, year after year, we're going to have to keep delivering because you don't get to just do some of this. You do all of it. Hitting that number has looked like a whole bunch of things. It's looked like new incentive schemes and collaborations with our primary care colleagues um, to shift away from some of the worst polluting uh, uh, medicines that we prescribe anything from uh, the nitrous that we use either for analgesia or an anesthetic, we're moving away from it, um, to the asthma inhalers that I'm sure some of the people on this call have heard of. Listen, there are some that are just clinically equivalent. Their carbon emissions are 20, 30 times what they need to be. We're getting rid of them. We're sick of having a nuanced conversation when we know that this is actively harming uh, our emissions, actively harming the planet. Um, so the NHS is shifting away from the same for desflurane, the same for some of those particularly polluting volatile anesthetic gases. Yep, there'll be a couple of fringe cases where we need them, but broadly we think we've figured out ways to get rid of some of the most polluting medicines that we use uh, because we just don't need them. And the best part about this is led by the Royal College of Nursing, led by the Royal College of Paramedics, College of General Practitioners and the College of Anesthetists. We've hit all of our goals. Obviously, we've hit all of our goals for digital care, providing care closer to the home, asking questions about access for our patients, making sure that they're getting the care they need in the way that they want. We hit them actually fourfold over. You can imagine why there was a pandemic. But hitting those, that saved us about 280 kilotons of carbon, and we've got an agreement built in now into the new planning guidance for the NHS. We're not going back. This is the way that the NHS now is going to start delivering care because our patients love it. Yes, we will always have the option of running care in person and we will always do that where it's appropriate to do that. But we're going to give people the choice and we're going to give them the option and it's going to save carbon. We have emissions in our travel and transport, how we move patients around the NHS. Very simple. Extend the duration of the contracts mandate that those contracts over time, over the next six years start to move from, fossil fuel, uh, diesel, petrol cars to zero emission. Diesel and petrol is old and we're not going to be using it the next couple of years. We're going to extend those contracts because zero emission cars, they run cheaper, they run cleaner. And so there's off, it actually quite often cost savings for a lot of our contractors and a lot of the people, a lot of the cars that we buy from. Um, we know that we can reduce emissions and we know that it's going to be more or less cost neutral. That stuff's going to be easy, but there is going to be some hard stuff. Uh, there are going to be parts of the NHS transport system that aren't going to decarbonize themselves because Elon Musk isn't going to help. Ambulances, rapid response vehicles. We're going to have to innovate there. We're hoping we'll have some friends, but I'm also hoping because I literally went and kicked the tires on the thing yesterday. I'm hoping that on Monday, 1st of November, we're going to be able to announce the world's first zero emission ambulance. It's taken us 12 months, but we've got there. We've got two, fully electric and an electric with a hydrogen range extender. We're really excited about that. 
It's only a small part of our emissions, but God, I can't think of anything else that embodies what the response to climate change means for a healthcare system. So we've done all of that. There's two bits of our emissions I haven't talked about yet in our estates and in our supply chain. For our estate, listen, people will always ask, but yes, Nick, isn't this very, very expensive? Isn't this going to cost us trillions of pounds, trillions of dollars? The answer to that is no, not really. You're right, though, for about 20% of the emissions, we can act, the NHS can act on 80% of its emissions, almost cost neutral. Doesn't bother us up front, we can just act on them. For about 20%, yes, there is a significant upfront capital requirement. The good news is that capital requirement pays itself back in two and a half to three years. It's just common sense energy efficiency measures. They're boring, but it's about heating your hospital right, it's about lighting your hospital right, it's about powering it right. And so we're investing in that. 310 million pounds in 21, 22, um, 580 million over the next three years. Really stepping that up to start to talk about for our older state, how do we get it up to standard? For the new estate, for the new hospitals that we're building, we've developed a new net zero hospital standard. The NHS will no longer build any more hospitals that are not built to that net zero standard. We're very serious about this. The last part of our emissions I haven't talked about is our supply chain. It's a big part of our emissions because the NHS, we purchase from 80,000 suppliers, every single country, 60 billion pounds worth of uh, stuff that we buy. Anything from mobility aids to paper, to those ambulances, to uh, the medicines we prescribe. We've been clear. By 2023, April 2023, the NHS, for all contracts over five million pounds, we will no longer purchase from anyone that does not publicly demonstrate that they are following our trajectory, that they are aligned with our values. All contracts over five million pounds. April 2027, all contracts full stop. The NHS, all 120 billion pounds of turnover, 60 billion pounds of procurement will no longer purchase from anyone that is not aligned with our uh, values. You might expect suppliers would turn around and say, what are you doing? We can't do this. This is impossible. This is going to be so difficult. AstraZeneca, GSK, at least they do our laundry. Some of our largest food suppliers, all of our transport and travel suppliers, Microsoft, 15 of the NHS's largest suppliers, Medtronic, Johnson & Johnson, Smith & Nephew, all of them said, okay, Nick, this looks like it's gonna be tough. We sat down with them for 12 months and you're about to hear uh, out the other side of COP, 15 of the largest healthcare companies in the entire world are gonna say, sure, we can do that. We're gonna align with the NHS and we're gonna deliver a net zero healthcare system. I'm gonna stop there, but the thing I wanna land on, finish on, the NHS was the world's first healthcare system to say something big, bold, maybe a little bit stupid. We're going to deliver a net zero health service. The very first one. I've already told you two things that are going to happen. There's going to be an ambulance and there's going to be a whole bunch of suppliers that are saying we can do that too. The next thing that's going to happen at this UN climate change conference in a couple of days, you're going to hear from not one, not five, but another 20 countries saying, do you know what? I reckon I could pull that off too. I reckon we could have a crack. In fact, in the case of Scotland, I reckon we could get there earlier. <laughs> the question doesn't become, oh my God, I can't believe the NHS did this. That's so big. It's so ambitious. Isn't that going to cost a lot? When there are 20 countries there, very quickly it'll be 40, 50, 100. The question will become, why on earth hasn't your country done that? Why on earth doesn't Australia have a net zero strategy for its entire federal healthcare system? Why on earth doesn't every single hospital in the country have a net zero strategy, internalized, localized, personalized? Why isn't there a board level lead? Why isn't there a clinical team leading this? Um, I think the world is at a tipping point where this is about to change fundamentally. France, the French healthcare system, very quietly, just hired, just put out job adverts for 180 climate change experts. The world is about to shift really quite seismically. Um, the question I think that we should all be asking ourselves at the moment is, are we ready for it?
but I'll stop there. Thank you very, very much. I hope I was coherent. It's 4.30 in the morning. I'm so sorry. Actually, Nick, you were very, very coherent and you were also very inspiring, I think. And I particularly like the way you gave us very specific examples. You know, it's not just an ambition, but you actually got down to the nitty gritty of what has to change. And I guess the first thing I'd ask you, obviously, we're in Australia, but based on your experience um, in the NHS, what do you think Australia would need to do in the next two years if it was to make real progress by 2030? You know, if those things don't happen, then nothing much will happen by 2030. What, 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 would you be, what advice would you be giving us? There you go, first one of the day. Yeah. Number one, everyone in Australia will say, yes, yes, okay, we are a state-based system, so we can't have federal commitments. I mean, listen, I sort of hear you. Germany said that until uh, give them half a second, um, they're about to change their mind and say, you know what, actually, yes, we can. Because of course you can. We have a federal minister of health. Of course we can make net zero national commitments. The states just have to be the people implementing it. Um, so number one, I would say get a big borderline and you know, ambitious sort of achievable goal, set it, set it publicly um, and develop a strategy around it. Um, number two, internalize that the whole way through the system, down to the states, down to uh, down to the individual hospitals, um, and throw some capacity into this stuff. Which of those various things, supply chain, transport, medicines, estates, any one hospital, state, or national team chooses to focus on, doesn't matter. Um, the only thing I think we've found, the only thing that matters, is that instead of talking about and strategizing and thinking about you just go and do it. Go and literally count the kilotons of carbon that you are reducing because that's where one of the problems that we face is there's not an enormous amount of carbon literacy in the NHS, right? We're a huge workforce, 1.4 million people. Not everyone really knows what to do about it. They're not going to learn what to do to respond to climate change from, you know, watching a webinar from me. They're going to learn by trying five times, messing it up four times and getting it right the fifth time. Mm. And do you see somebody's asked, you know, given we have this federated system, I guess the UK does too, in terms of you've got NHS Wales, Scotland and so on. But do you see that offers either advantages for Australia in that states can experiment or do you see the difficulties of federation as making it harder? I see it as no excuse. There are other reasons why Australia might be a little slow on some of this stuff, but uh, but the makeup of its states and its you know uh, and its federated healthcare absolutely no excuse for not taking this seriously. Um, look, you could run it multiple ways. Every state could have its own net zero target, or you could run it nationally. There's obviously going to be need for a bit of coordination because there are things that you know the federal government can do that the uh, states can't, particularly around supply chain. Right. And uh, at some point, we're going to have to talk about that kind of stuff. I'd say both. Right. Why not? Why not both? It's not particularly an excuse to say we can only do one or the other. Um, maybe you start with one, though. And I know that in Australia and Western Australia, I know in Queensland, New South Wales, um, uh, I'll say Western Australia again, one or two more times. Um, there's already good progress there. And that's fantastic. So let's consolidate that across every part of the country and then build up nationally. Yeah, and people are also asking what role have groups like our academy played and what do you see the role of our academy might be in this? It's a good question. I was talking to, um, to the Wellcome Trust to their, uh, to their new chair, actually, um, who I'm sure everyone here will be familiar with, Julia Gillard, um, yeah. just the other day about that and what role uh, the Wellcome Trust can play in, as part of the NHS transition and then also what role... Um, the Academy of Medical Sciences in the United Kingdom can play. Um, I said something that I sort of flippantly pushed over. Um, I don't have all the answers. The NHS doesn't know precisely, doesn't know what 2039 and 11 months is going to look like. Um, we know what the first five years are going to look like. We're probably going to chase after it, but we don't know what this thing looks like the whole way through. We are going to have to figure that out for ourselves. I have nothing but research questions. I have nothing but things that I need clinicians to go and experiment with, play around with. All the stuff I'm talking about around inhalers, around nitrous, around anesthetics. Yes, yes, I'm talking, you know, with a lot of bravado. Um, 
but there are a lot of uncertainties there. It is a tricky transition that we're going to have to manage and we need clinicians to start to engage in all of those research questions uh, because it has to be clinically led because they're going to do it in a way that doesn't raise an army of patients up against us. Um, that's probably the biggest thing. You wouldn't believe how important it is to have independent science, independent uh, research backing up the work that we're doing. That's what got us over the line with our net zero commitments. When we make uh, our, in when we developed our in inhaler incentive scheme, we were able to do it because the Royal Society over here, because the Royal College of General Practitioners, because the Wellcome Trust were standing behind us saying, yes, and here's the evidence. Yeah, so in that line, um, Christabel Saunders asked, could we add a carbon price to any tests we order? <laughs> Would that work? It's a really fun game to play. We actually played around with that, not just for tests, right. but for, um, for everything. We played around with the idea of uh, an internal carbon price for the NHS and whether we could manage that. Number one, uh, God, that would be tricky to actually implement. Microsoft has one of those, but Microsoft does data very, very well. We use faxes and, uh, and pages in the NHS. Um, uh, so look, you would need a lot of data to be able to pull something like that off. The, the other thing I would say is we have to be a little bit cautious in that we want to embed carbon into clinical decision-making when there is an alternative that we can suggest. Now, if the suggestion is, listen, do you really need to be doing that test? Because really, do we need to do another CRP just for the fun of it? Sure, right? That's, that's a point well worth making. But we also talked about it for the different medications we prescribe. And yes, I can talk to you about the carbon emissions of asthma inhalers and of anesthetic gases and indeed of uh, ACE inhibitors and uh, insulin because I have good alternatives that I can recommend for you that you can still provide excellent care to your patients. But we keep this to ourselves, but the carbon emissions of clozapine are very, very high. Now, yeah. it's not going to be much help telling everyone that other than to tell the manufacturer who can help to reduce emissions because the clinicians should really just go on and prescribe that clozapine. Um, and so I just think we need to be a little bit nuanced about how we build carbon into our clinical decision making. Yeah, one other thing, I mean, you've been very good at pointing out the economics of, of the change, both in times when there has to be the investment made up front. Do you actively work with your treasury department to do that? Because I'm often, you know, in healthcare spending, it's the treasury that wants to put the brake on. So how, how does that work? We do actively work with the treasury. We have um, really good links. We have gone out 12 months, right? We've gone out and we have worked with the Treasury, we worked with the Department of Transport, with our Environment Department, um, working to establish this as a proper, you know, how can the NHS support the transition in general? We have land, we have lots of roof space, we're building solar panels on many of the roofs of many of our hospitals. Um, and yeah, the arguments with the Treasury obviously are principally around capital, around return on investment, yeah. around leveling up across the country. How are we investing in particularly deprived areas in the United Kingdom? Um, look, it's a slightly different political situation in the United Kingdom to what it is in Australia. We have yeah. a Treasury who is asking us, what are you doing to, to respond to climate change? So we are able to say, this is what we're doing. And they say, fantastic. Um, that will come. In Australia, I promise, yeah. right? It's, it's not a question of, you know, uh, is the world going to head there? Everyone is, no question, right? It's a question of are you ready for the change? Yeah, I think one advantage you have in the UK is that Margaret Thatcher was a chemist who really understood um, sure. the, the, the chemistry of it all. And I think that's had a big legacy in the UK in, in believing the science. science. It, it certainly has. One of the things in the United Kingdom that we are... Uh, lucky to have is um, look whether you are on the left or the right of the political spectrum doesn't change whether or not you believe or whether or not you want to respond to yeah. climate change both sides desperately want to respond to climate change they have very different ways of doing it sometimes slightly different ambitions but you're right Fran you know yeah. everyone wants to respond wants to do it yeah um, another question, again, from Christabel Saunders, where she says the lack of green energy means recycling health products is less carbon neutral than mm. just buying new. But she says, how can health influence energy portfolios? Do you have any experience of that? Sure. So entirely right. And we have that problem from time to time as well. Yeah. Um, in part, we have to remember, obviously, no one says you should do you know, just one thing as, as you respond to climate change. You do all of it. 
but it does all depend on each other, right? Your recycling starts to break down if your grid is not decarbonized. Um, we do all sorts of things with our national grid, with our Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy in the United Kingdom. Um, I was on the phone to them just the other day because we were getting rid of the last coal and the last oil boiler in the United Kingdom, uh, heating a hospital. Keep quiet about that. Um, uh, the grid wasn't quite ready to absorb that. The local DNO, the local sort of distribution system for, for that wasn't quite ready. And so we got on the phone with our friends at Bayes and said, listen, we really need you guys to sort this out for us. You know, I know it'll take six, 12 months. And they said, no, 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 we'll get this. We'll prioritize this. It's really important that we help the NHS as it works to decarbonize. Um, so number one, build some strong relationships with the people that are working on this with you across government. Um, number two, send some strong signals. Listen, uh, for important reasons that aren't worth particularly going into, simply purchasing green energy, 100% renewable energy, if you are a hospital, doesn't really reduce emissions by an actual electron, doesn't actually reduce uh, reduce the sort of carbon that you're pumping out into the atmosphere because the grid doesn't shift that day. But God, it sends a signal. God, number 10 noticed when every single hospital, 40% of public sector energy all at once swapped in and started requiring 100% renewable energy because we absorbed the entirety of the country's uh, supply. Um, sent a really powerful signal. So number one, work with government. Number two, send some strong signals. The third thing I think is, look, <laughs> a healthcare system is never going to get into the business of uh, powering itself in entirety, right? We have, we have national uh, energy departments for that, um, but we can help and a little bit of expertise along that wouldn't hurt. So Milton King's Hospital, 2,500 solar panels on its roof, Wolverhampton Hospital a little further north, 3,000 solar panels on some brown land just to the left of it powering both the hospital, the mental health trust, and a couple of community care centres. We're starting to move into that area as well. Yeah, that's great, Nick. We're getting near to the time for winding up, but I'll just note that Warwick Anderson, who's also co-chair of the Academy's Climate Change and Health Committee, has just pointed out that a lot of our climate change action actually has happened in the states and provided examples rather than sure. federally. Sure. But I wonder, just to come back to COP26, which is going to be such a sort of big moment, you've talked about getting these other countries, the build-up of countries. In your role, are you able to kind of offer technical advice, particularly to low- and middle-income countries, about, about that issue? Yeah. Um, I say it all the time. Um, the NHS, uh, we cannot... By definition, and if anyone tells you they can, they can, they're lying to you. We cannot get to net zero unless everyone does it with us, unless every healthcare system moves with us, unless every single supplier. In fact, this is a secret. The NHS can't get to net zero unless Australia does. Right. And to that extent, absolutely, we are actively building up our capacity to offer any kind of support to any country that comes asking. We have uh, 10, 15 countries that we are working with, national governments we're working with, we will share any data we have. Um, this is different to a lot of the core business, right? We are open up, we are opening up, we are democratizing a lot of the work that we have um, because if Australia came out, if New Zealand came out with a net zero target that was, you know, one month faster than ours, that would be great. This is an area where we desperately want competition. I'm really excited about the new executive order we expect to see from President Biden. They're going to do exactly that. They're going to try and trump us by about a year. How fantastic. We're now having a competition between the United Kingdom and the United States about how quickly we can get to net zero. It's, um, yeah. it's going to be a really cool decade. We're going to have a lot of fun. Yeah, well, Nick, that sounds like kind of collaborative competition, which, yeah. uh, which is really what we need. And I'll just say one of the final comments was, can we have a clone of you to come to Australia and do this <laughs> with us? But that would be wonderful. But look, I'd like to thank you so much for getting up at that time in the morning and just being really inspirational. It's really fantastic work you're doing and keep on doing it. And I hope that soon we'll be able to say that Australia is competing with you for, for um, reaching net zero. So thank you very much. And I'll hand over to Graham. Thank you. Can I, Graham, just one more thing, just before I go. I, thank you to everyone here. Um, <laughs> you wouldn't believe how far Australia has come on this. It may not feel this way if you are in the middle of it, but, you know, I'm from Perth. Um, not long ago, it would have been inconceivable that Australia would have this many teams, state teams working on health and climate change. Inconceivable that this conference would even have this as a, as a session there. 
Um, the world is moving and it's moving quickly, even if you can't see it when you're in the eye of the storm. So thank you. Oh, look, uh, Nick, uh, thank you so much. Uh, and, and thank you, Fran, uh, for such a, a brilliant session. Uh, I, I can't recall a presentation that, is, uh, that has really given me so much hope. Uh, I think all of us, uh, even in the middle of all the COVID crisis, are still weighed down so heavily uh, by the failure uh, internationally and in our own country to take significant action on climate change. So to see the NHS do something so brilliant and so quickly uh, is, is simply wonderful. Thank you again. So that uh, concludes the first day of our annual meeting program. I'd like to extend a, a, a really warm thanks to all of the pre presenters and, and panelists and, and chairs who've contributed to it. Tomorrow, I'd like to uh, highlight the fact that we have another excellent lineup of speakers, uh, and these include Associate Professor Lisa Wobb, who will be presenting on the implementation of research to maximise impact on health, and Professor Sir John Saville, who will be presenting on harnessing research for better health, a vision for integrating research into healthcare. And so shortly, uh, the annual general meeting of the Academy uh, will begin. Uh, it'll begin at 3.30pm, uh, that's Eastern Daylight Savings Time. This is a closed event for fellows of the Academy who will, received an, who will have received an email with a unique web link to participate in the AGM. If you need further assistance gaining access, please email events at aahms.org. And then the Academy and... CSL award ceremony will follow the AGM and you can watch that using the same web page as you've been using to watch the annual meeting. We look forward to seeing you virtually again tomorrow for day two of the annual meeting. Thank you everyone. See you tomorrow.